sounds incredibly time consuming that's actually not very time consuming, which is called popcorn introductions. So what popcorn introductions is, you get the mic, you stand up, and you say your name and the company that you're with, and then you pass the mic to the person next to you. And we are gonna zip around the room and hear who's here, and that'll help you know either for your conversations in this session or who you wanna sit next to at lunch later, who we've got in the room. So I am going to make my way to our first popcorn uh, introduction person and then I'll just help keep the mic going around the room. There we go. Sherry Austin, Royal Bank of Canada. This is the Canadian table. I'm Marie Rajik with TransCanada Corporation. Hi, Jennifer Chow from Barclays. Sean Gibbons from Target. Emmy Wise Vanguard. Kara Sasaki, PG&E. Arlene Ibsen, Travelers. Mike Newman, Travelers. Patricia Devereaux, MasterCard. Good morning, Sashay Cantu, BBVA. Christine Newman, Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation. Hugh McStravick, PNC Financial Services. Vaughn Kenny, Applied Materials. I'm Bruce Charendoff with Sabre. Heather Nestle with New York Life. Maria Collins, New York Life. Terrific. Some of our insurance companies over here. Okay. Deborah Bitten with Southwest Airlines. Teresa Sauls with Centerpoint Energy. Enid Wallace Sims, Delmarva Power. Good morning. Catherine Walsh from Cody. Michael Strike, CECP. Thea Cartagena, Citigroup. Rachel Ibarra, AT&T. Travelers. Suzette Brissett, Cody Inc. Uh, Kristen Scheider, Citigroup. Okay. Amy Sears, UBS. Christina Raycop, Devon Energy. Rafferty with BD. Grabs Connect Nichols into Public Group. John Pacheco, U.S. Bank. A.T. Bold, BNY Mellon. Lois Steel, Carlson. Charlie Agee, Altry Group. David Barris, GE Foundation. Good morning, Janice Parks, McDonald's Corporation. Okay, I'm coming your way, guys. Julie, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Julie Gerke, Walmart. Lauren Cunningham, KPMG. Lynn Northington, Target. Ms. Johnson Wright, Capital One. Charlie Lewis, Adobe. Frank Romeo, UPS. John Bernhard, PPL. There, Entergy. All right. This time with feeling. <laughs> Joe Wall, PNC. Mary Linda Andrews, GSK Pharmaceuticals. Remy Noble, Humana. Greg Carter, Humana. Dana Pancrazy, FB Heron Foundation. Lisa McDougall, Goldman Sachs. Christine Salerno, Marsh McLennan Companies. Maddie Gardner, Discovery Communications. Kathleen Reardon, Citizens Financial Group. Perfect. Well, thanks everyone. I appreciate your patience with an exercise like that. But I think uh, what we just learned is we're gonna have some pretty fantastic table discussions because I think at our tables we've learned that we have a lot of great companies represented in a nice mix of industries too. Well, so now let me share with you who's actually up on stage. I will, help, I will assist your popcorn introductions. We have Greg Hills, who is a managing director of FSG. And Greg has been in the consulting field for 20 years, 10 of the most recent ones and counting at FSG, and leads the company's global development practice. So you'll see Greg's name behind a lot of the most influential white papers um, and practitioner reports, particularly around the subject of shared value. And we're very lucky to have him here uh, to represent 
FSG's thinking on collective impact. And then next to him is Plam Faraday, who's the president and CEO of the City Foundation, a longtime city employee, and not always in the foundation, in the HR function, in consumer retail. And she's got a big job. City's active in over 89 countries and tries to bring a more than philanthropy approach to the way that you get tough social work done. And I think that's where collaboration comes in. So what I'm going to start with is asking our two panelists here to provide a little bit of context in terms of what this discussion is going to be about. And once we've heard a little bit from them on that, I'm going to take a pause and make sure that I understand what you all are trying to get out of this session. So I'm going to look for one or two or three volunteers to tell us what it is you're hoping to learn in collaboration, what brought you here today, and we'll try to make sure that we cover off on that before the session's over. So let me start with the very basic question, almost a define your terms question. And I'm going to give this one to Greg, which is, do we have a definition of collaboration? What's the difference between writing a grant and being a collaborator? He's not, he's not on mic. So the, the term collaboration, you know, it's I got no mic on. a lot of folks can define differently. I think about it more as a spectrum versus a yes, no, and a spectrum from doing something that's a typical funder, grant fee relationship, or public-private partnership type of arrangement, to funder collaboratives, to multi-stakeholder coalitions, and you, you've heard a lot of those terms. And then at the far end of the spectrum is this notion of collective impact. And that's what I'll sort of double click on. But just it'd be curious to sort of show of hands of the people in the room that have heard about this term collective impact. Okay, good, good 75, 80% of the room. Um, so at, at, at FSG, you know, we're a mission-driven consulting firm. We actually were um, the sort of originators of the term. We haven't actually created necessarily sort of that, that actual effort in happening with folks beforehand. And, Folks know the Strive partnership in Cincinnati that we uh, that sort of reflected in the article that where we sort of coined this term. Um, you know, having sort of written about it and, and codified it, it really has sort of taken on, and folks have used the, the, the notion to, um, to energize their communities around it and um, to really sort of uh, provide a framing to a lot of the work that a lot of very effective uh, cross sector collaborations have had. So I'll just I'll provide a sort of a, a brief description of what that is, just so we understand what it is, and I'll go into more details later. But so we define it as a commitment of a group of important actors uh, from different sectors to a common agenda to address a specific social problem. Okay, so you've got a couple of pieces there, which are different sectors, common agenda, and a specific problem. And we got, we define sort of five elements that that are conditions of success. Um, so first is that, that notion of a common agenda or shared vision, if you will, for what everyone's trying to achieve versus just sort of all being generically in education. Um, secondly is you have shared measurement. You actually are, are committing to the same results and measuring those results together as opposed to separate measurements for each organization. Third, you have mutually reinforcing activities. That means that not everyone's doing the same thing, but you're doing what you're good at, and those are, are working together to make a whole. Uh, fourth, you have continuous communication. So you know, regular meetings, the senior people coming together to talk about things, so that these things are not once a year you come together and talk about the same issue and say, yeah, we should do more about that. It's really about working together and communicating very, very closely. And then lastly, I think this is the most important piece that we often don't see when, when uh, sort of local coalitions are not working, is the notion of a backbone organization or a backbone sort of function. And that's something that sort of holds things together, not necessarily program implementers, but something that sort of provides that communications, the, the measurements, the structure, if you will, among the different organizations. So that's, those are sort of the, the common sort of elements, and we'll talk about how some of those manifest themselves in different examples. I think it's very helpful in terms of kind of formalizing for us, what are the boundaries of this? Help us understand what the contours of the playing field are here, so we know kind of the scope of what we're talking about. I imagine as you were hearing that from Greg, there might have been a little difficulty ticker going off in the
wow, okay, that, that list of five things sounds pretty hard. Um, we're going to get into the motivations of why you might do it anyway um, in a minute. But first, I want to hear from Pam. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Partners in Progress program and the way you think about it and um, kind of its objective when it launched, just to give people a sense of, of how you come at this issue of, of, of collaboration. Uh, let me just say uh, the origins that uh, we're a member of the Living Cities uh, organization and the, our integration initiative in Five City, we built on the Stride uh, example. Uh, and so we became very interested in this and we uh, supported an effort to look at the future of community development in the United Mike? States. She the problem? This is at a sort of a critical no. point. And we worked with the Low Income uh, it's, it's Investment right. Fund, which is the leading CFI in the country, help. and uh, the San Francisco right. Fed. And we started out with the idea of a white paper and ended up with a book <laughs> called Investing in What Works for America's Health. I'm bringing up her mic just so I hear it, maybe. exactly a slightly different terminology, but the same yeah, idea of uh, the necessity of getting these independent pillars of community development, people who work on housing, the people who work in education, the people who work on health, people who are worried about transit or whatever, and that, guess what, and this debate that's been going on for years between people in place uh, and the answer is uh, delivered in the book is both one. You need both the people focus and the place focus, and you need these coalitions of groups that come up with holistic solutions. And in this case, uh, Greg referred to it as a backbone organization. This book refers to it as a community quarterback. So we put out a request for proposal. We said, this is interesting that we created this idea. How do we make it happen? Collaboration has to happen on the ground in communities. How can we be supported? So we put out a request for proposal. And we have 14 different organizations uh, across the country who are engaged in different forms of collective impact and who are playing the role of uh, community quarterback. And uh, what's interesting about it is these 14 organizations are not doing it on their own. In fact, it started with, a with all of them coming together to learn from each other. And at every stage, they get together, they report, they have, we have formal ways that they can share their experience, but they also do it informally as well. And we provide um, uh, resources and technical assistance. Actually, a feature of the program is that they get to work with purpose, um, because a key part of what they need to do is mobilize their communities. That's what they're trying to do. So uh, uh, the purpose folks have met with them in the beginning, They've had individual working sessions with them, and they will be meeting with them at the second uh, uh, gathering uh, in June. So we can talk later about the learnings that have come out from this, but I can assure you they've been very rich. So the contours of it are, you're focused on community development. You've got these 14 grantees who are serving as your quarterbacks or your backbone organization, and you're tackling this because you see an intense interconnectedness of the social issues that people are working on in little local silos, but you feel like if they were to come together and be organized, you might actually start to see some progress against these things. But you can't just work on one little part of the program here and one little part of the problem there. You've got to unite people and get them working together and collaborating so that you can actually start to see some change. Because I think one thing that, that um, grant makers think about all the time is um, you know, where, where does my social problem that I'm focused on end? You know, you can try to solve education and then you find yourself trying to solve hunger and then you try to find yourself, you know, um, in immigration conversation. I mean, you can start out in one social issue and then realize the interconnectedness of that social issue to so many other problems. And I think that's when a model like collective impact really becomes important. Well, let me ask you now, you've heard a little bit um, about what Greg thinks are the five components of a successful collaboration. We now understand the program that Pam has been working on and where she'll be coming from on this panel. Is there anybody who wants to volunteer a thought or two about what you'd like to get out of this session or what you think makes collaboration difficult that we can make sure we cover in our time together? Any volunteers, any hands? Yeah, sure, Kate. Um, this resistance, piece of resistance that if we do this fantastic collaborative piece, 
who's going to get credit? How do we do the media slash? You know, where's the visibility for we? All right, getting getting credit in <coughs> collaboration. You'll have some time to think about that. I won't ask you that right away. Anybody else have something that they think is difficult about collaboration that you want to hear our panelists talk about? Yeah, come on in, and then I'll go to the back. sort of started as a 
sort of volunteering community service effort and became sort of a bottom-up effort that was, you know, sort of helping some of the poorest neighborhoods within Indianapolis with something that's actually a really, really impressive effort. You told us to expect that we would hear motivations on either end of yeah. the spectrum, and so whether it's born out of self-interest, I want to be able to sell candy bars 25 years from now, so I better do something about my focus supply today, or Indianapolis is the heart and soul of our, of our employee base in this city, and we want to give something back, and how do we mobilize that in a way that people can really feel is meaningful? So Pam, maybe what I'll do is ask you to insert city in that spectrum of motivations and tell us what was happening in the firm, mm. what had you been doing, and then why did you decide to take on something so bold? Um, I think for us, um, we, we always say that we're more than philanthropy, and we try to leverage all the resources and assets of the company. Um, our philanthropy doesn't directly go have business results, but our business assets can definitely uh, enhance our philanthropy and our community engagement. For us, it's both a business motivation and a motivation around um, uh, giving back to society. We're a financial institution. Uh, community development has been uh, something that is expected of us to do. We have been a leader in it for 50 years or more. Uh, it, it's, uh, we have activities on the philanthropic side. We have activities on the business side. We're a big financier of low-income housing, of you know, all, all kinds of things. And secondly, our company is focused on cities. Um, we call it internally City for Cities. We are a global uh, institution. We have, uh, on, on, we used to say that we have on the ground operations with people in 110 countries. Now we say we're in 150 global cities. So it is the combination of the importance of community development, which is a, using our skills and abilities. It's, it's a focus on cities. And it's building on a long tradition of being engaged in community development. So we said, where is community development going in this country? And we started out with a thought leadership piece. That's what the book was all about. And then we said, but one of our uh, imperatives is to not only uh, contribute to thought leadership, but actually getting things done. And I actually think in this project, in this initiative, it's much more than a project, we are contributing to both. Things are happening in these neighborhoods. Right here in New York City, one of the efforts is in Brownsville, one of the communities in Brooklyn that has not been gentrified. Believe it, there are some communities that have not been gentrified in Brooklyn. Um, uh, and in, in other communities, we are doing stuff on the ground that makes a difference. In Brownsville, they have an objective by 2017 to employ 5,000 residents of Brownsville. That's their objective. So some of it can be right here in the here and now, but I think we're also contributing to the learning of what works in collaboratives and what's hard and what needs to be done to prepare community organizations to really be effective uh, quarterbacks. Let's pick up on that theme of quarterbacks, because I think that's one thing, whether it's the backbone organization or the quarterback, I mean, one insight or aha oh. from the research and from your on the ground consultant that you've done is you need somebody who's really willing to kind of own it and move it forward. An example I think of, we were in Minneapolis last year, and there was some free Minnesota, and they had a backbone organization to try to bring all these companies together to try and get, I think it was a million okay. meals in three years, something like that. But it wouldn't have worked without the quarterback in a backbone organization. So I'm going to ask you to explain this concept, and I'm going to do it in a slightly provocative way, but I'm going to start with you, is what's the difference between a quarterback or a backbone institution and a middleman? In other words, why is this an important way? Why is this something that's necessary as opposed to just um, a, redundant, uh, a redundant feature when you can go to these other uh, organizations yourself? So what happens with collective impact efforts is, is often that sort of middle layer or intermediary or whatever just doesn't exist. But there's not a, a, a natural organization that is focused on the efforts that are required for a backbone organization. So there's a lot of organizations who could play that role, certainly, that think about United Ways or community foundations or others that have sort of their tentacles in the community and would be a natural place to think about a backbone okay. where you can house potentially. But they're often not sort of the role of connecting all of these organizations to a specific shared agenda with shared management, et cetera. So it's, um, 
it, it, it needs to be sort of created, whether it's a, an actual nonprofit itself oh, he's coming in or now. whether it's just a function, it doesn't matter. And I think you know, in the experience that Lily had, they didn't create a backup. Uh, like a separate nonprofit, and, and the, the, the various participants, once they started getting funding from various sources, which I can talk about, they actually wanted to create a backbone, but they resisted it. They said, no, 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 we've got enough nonprofits. Okay. What we need is for folks to just be doing the differentiated activities, and we can, you know, have uh, this organization receive the Kresge money, and this organization receive the money from the Community Foundation, and this organization can you know, receive the National Science Foundation money, and they just sort of work together on it versus one organization being set up, it's a 501c3 that has all those reporting requirements, et cetera, because that's sort of extra time and effort. Other situations we've seen, you know, folks have actually created an organization and it makes sense. Yeah, so it's more about the work getting done as opposed to you need kind of a branded institution to take ownership of that. Okay, well that's helpful because I think that can be a little bit confusing. It, it sounds like, okay, there has to be a quarterback, uh, but it's more, there's some, there has to be the function of a quarterback. It's a, it's a function, yeah, that, that provides the sort of necessary infrastructure that could be cobbled together among different yeah, okay, great. Well, so um, I think figuring out how that quarterback function is going to occur and whether or not there is a naturally incurring leading organization in the community where you want to have an impact to take up that role or if it's something that your staff is going to do, I think is an important decision point. So maybe we can come back to that. But I want to hear from Pam a little bit about how you chose those 14 partners and, and what some of the filters and screens were. But I want to ask the audience something. I'm going to read the names of some of these partners, and I want a show of hands if this is an organization that you're reasonably familiar with. East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation out of Oakland. Couple hands, right? Uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation out of Norwalk. Couple hands. Fraser Revitalization Inc. out of Dallas, Texas. One hand going up. So the point I'm trying to make here is the people who live in those areas know these organizations, but the rest of you haven't heard of them, right? So this shows like you've really done a job of identifying the locally relevant organizations. I didn't list Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Red Cross, Habitat, hyper-local organizations who have 10, 20 plus years of experience in that community. What were you looking for when you sought out to find them? Did you have help in that? Um, and what criteria were you looking for to know to put your trust in them for this, for this ambitious agenda? Um, we, uh, let me just say that uh, of these organizations, the large majority either viewed that they were ta already playing somewhat of a quarterback role or they were expanding um, their quarterback role. I think there are only two, uh, or a small number who are saying, I'm going to take on this function as a, um, a totally new function for our organization. But they all wanted to take it to a different level. And I would say in this case, the, the uh, grantees, our partners in this, are all playing the quarterback organization. They're not new. They are, these are long-standing partners in the community. They've taken on this function. And I would say that uh, I'll, I'll get to the criteria, but I do want to point out that they have all learned this is not an easy function to do. The challenges of uh, getting uh, participation in the community, which is what Purpose is helping them with, um, the challenges of setting goals, uh, creating metrics, and metrics is not just like Brownsville saying we want 5,000 jobs in 2017. You have to have metrics right now that show progress to getting there, right? So if the only uh, metric of success you had was we got to 5,000, that wouldn't be very inspiring uh, on the front end of this effort where you're going to have to put a lot of things in place uh, to get there. So data is difficult. Being a quarterback is difficult. Working with local government organizations who may not have the same uh, sense of speed that these collaboratives do. These are all some of the issues that they're grappling with. And I think, again, one of the wonderful things about the structure of this is its collaboration among the quarterback organizations. So they are learning from each other, both formally uh, and informally. Um, 
I referred to the fact that we worked with the Low Income Investment Fund, Nancy Andrews, a longtime leader in community development, and with some wonderful folks at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, San Francisco. Uh, it may sound like an oxymoron that the Federal Reserve Bank is a, um, is, is a leading innovation, but in fact, they definitely do uh, and are a, a wonderful partner. So um, we are a collaborator with them. But in every sense, they have helped uh, to drive this, and uh, Low Income Investment Fund and Nancy have been um, leaders all along the way. We brought together a group of some of the leaders in community development to help us look. We had an RFP, okay. um, and we got lots of uh, folks who wanted to be part of this uh, of, of this initiative, and we had uh, the, our blue ribbon panel of people who sat in a room for a full day. Um, and went through uh, each one of the um, applications. And clearly, part of it was uh, organizations that we thought had the capability and the strength to do this. It's not easy. Um, part of it is the credibility. You mentioned most of the, these are not startup organizations. These are organizations that have um, a lot of credibility and a track record. Um, these are organizations, in some cases, uh, uh, to be honest, some uh, got higher points for one thing versus another. Um, there were some where a charismatic leader makes a difference because uh, we want to get the word out and we want, to, um, we want a thought leadership component to this to come out the other end. So we had uh, a, robust, a robust set of criteria. We, so we city foundation could not, we, we were one vote among many in the room. I wouldn't say that we were not influential, um, but it clearly was um, a group decision of a group of people who know this field well. So I, for me, there are two major insights to come out of the comments you just shared uh, that tie back to the question about, um, it was asked in a couple of different ways, how can you encourage your nonprofits to collaborate with one another, or like when do you decide whether to force them to collaborate with one another? I think what we're hearing from Pam is, with this RFP process, people are self-selecting to say, I want to be part of a collaborative process. And then it's your backbone organization or the community organization that's saying, to its peers, we want you to collaborate. So it's not necessarily city that's sending out that message. It's this organization that's very relevant to that organization, that's, to that community that's been there for 20 years saying, we think collaboration could help. We think working together could help. So do, I mean, is that a mischaracterization? No, but I want to add one thing on the communications. Sure. Someone asked, how can you get credit, quote unquote? Yeah, let's touch on that. First of all, doing an RFP is a wonderful way to communicate to a very broad audience. Not everybody's going to get selected, but a lot of people are going to know that you're active in this field. Not a bad way. It, cre it creates a lot of work, and there, but that's one of the key advantages. Um, secondly, it depends on what your audience is. I mean, we, it matters to us a lot that we be viewed um, as a leader in the community development organizations across the United States. So we, our objective was not necessarily to communicate to 100 million consumers in the United States. Um, we have a much more targeted view. Um, thirdly, I would say, again, we're very targeted on cities. And most of the cities, um, whether it's mayors or um, influential organizations or influential people, they care about these things and are very um, aware of them. So for us, um, the communications objectives uh, were very much served by this. And again, remember, we have on the ground learning and we also have thought leadership opportunities. So there will be lots of opportunities for us to share this learning in meetings like this and, and, and other gatherings. Great. Well, I'm going to open up a bit of a Pandora's box here because I'm going to ask Greg, before we go to the small table discussion, to just share the beginnings of the, your thinking on the measurement question. Measurement is hard enough when it's you and one grantee. Um, now you're talking about 14 or more organizations in this network or the other examples that you referenced. Can you tell us what some of the challenges are with measuring these initiatives and, and, and give the, a, a taste as to how people can start to shape their thinking to be able to meet those challenges? Yeah, so it's no secret to the people in this room that measurement, even if you're just one organization doing grant making to, to one or several grantees that are in a similar type of activity, it's super challenging, right? There's a lot of things that are happening that are out of your control. There's a sort of the sort of contribution versus attribution question. 
there's sort of the sort of short term, medium term, long term outcomes question. There's the what's the value to the business versus what's the value to society. And that's all before you start talking about working with others. Right? That's all before you start talking about working in a collective impact environment. So, so it's a challenging sphere, one. Two, when you start talking and working with others around sort of a common agenda, you, you need to subordinate some of these uh, own sort of interests around sort of business value and sort of social impact that you've designed. And you're almost sort of giving in a little bit to this collective sense of what's important. And that requires uh, some level of sort of maturity and trust in the process. Sort of this collective impact is as much about the process as it is about sort of how you, whether you're addressing the issue or not. So you sort of have to give over to the process and let the, the identification of the indicators, the identification of the goals, the identification of the, of the how you're gonna measure those be determined by the group and led by the steering committee. And then to sort of have that be how you measures the success of, of the collective impact effort. And then going back to your own organization, there's things you have to track and sort of report up to your bosses as to what is the progress in terms of some of the process metrics, et cetera. And that can be part of that. But I think that the orientation for this really does need to be about sort of what is the sort of collective impact effort going to be measuring versus what are we going to get out of it today and in six months and in 12 months. And FSG has released a series of reports that are free on your website about how to um, evaluate collective impact. And there are um, there are some suggestions. There, there are some great suggestions as to kind of how you think about it. And I think that's an important point you made about process with regard to measurement. I think too many times measurement is this rear view mirror that you look in to decide whether or not you should give yourself a pat on the back or, or kind of maybe not share your story as widely. But using measurement throughout the rollout of a project to help you understand where you need to course correct, where you need to make adjustments, I think is the more powerful way of using measurement. Um, so I think the fact that you highlighted process with regard to measurement, I think is very important. So what were- The question about sort of the early stage and the lessons, I mean, I think that the, the measurement process actually is very different at the beginning when you're just sort yes. of developing it and figuring out what the process should be. And that's very much the sort of notion of a developmental evaluation, which some folks are probably familiar with versus when you're getting into sort of the medium stages where you're looking um, you know, more sort of what some of the progress on your indicators are, and then ultimately the summit evaluation at the end. So it's like very different types of activities, much like you would with any other effort, but that applies also to collective impact. So you set a commitment to measurement in the beginning, but the measurements themselves change over time. I'm gonna take one question now, and then we're gonna go into table discussion, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, the measurement period, did, the mesh. Ah, well, for us, um, we're supporting these organizations to put in place their measures. So right now, we're six months in. They'll be six months into this in June. So they will report to us on what what progress they have made to uh, and share with each other on setting metrics for each of their organizations. So for us right now, our measure of success is not um, Brownsville's 2017 goal. It's does Brownsville made progress in determining its metrics for the collaborative and putting in place the structures that will enable them to collect that data. And one of the things I think is really interesting is, you know, this is a lot of grunt work. Um, and to some extent, you have to look at what, what's around that you can use uh, in the case of Brownsville, it turns out that the Small Business Services of New York City tracks in, this is a legacy of the Bloomberg years, tracks in exhaustive detail um, everyone who has come into a city workforce center for a job. So it turns out that on the average across the city, one in four people who go through that process gets a job. In Brownsville, it's one in nine but they have details. They know exactly why somebody w did not was not successful, who was, where they got that job, what those jobs were, et cetera. So it turned out that there's this treasure trove of material that they can use to begin uh, their setting up metrics and, frankly, to set up the actual content of the program uh, going forward. So 
tapping into an existing comprehensive resource than rather than rather than trying to create one for yourself. Great. Well, so what we'd like to do with about 15 minutes in the program now is let you talk amongst yourselves. Um, 15 minutes has a way of going very quickly in small table discussion. You could easily spend it reintroducing yourselves, perhaps this time with your titles. I don't recommend doing that. The 15 minutes is going to be over very quickly. Um, I don't recommend deciding who's going to be the note taker and report back person, because we're not going to ask you to take notes or report back. Really, this is just 15 minutes from you to share. Is there something that's come out from the panel that resonates with you? Is there something that you disagree with? Is, is there kind of an, a persistent question at your table that when we go to Q&A, you want to be sure to ask the panel? Um, so we have some suggested questions for you, um, you know, one being what types of collaboration has your company been engaged in and how does that compare to what you're hearing from Pam and Greg? Or do you see potential for your company to play a catalytic role? But, but really it's to help your tables get the most out of a chance to talk to one another. This panel, this table right here has a little advantage because Kristen Scheider right there is the manager of this program. Okay, well, good. So um, use the next 15 minutes however is most impactful to you. I would ask somebody at each table to be brave and kind of make that first comment to get the ball rolling, perhaps about a collaboration that you've done or one that you've seen work, and then we'll pull everybody together in about 15 minutes. We, of course, want the ability to close with some thoughts about what what advice they have for companies who are contemplating this, and if the, the full Monty of you know, running a collective impact uh, project is too much for you, what some other ways you might get involved might be. So we'll be sure to close on that. But does anybody want to share something that came up in their uh, discussion that you want to make sure the panel addresses? No immediate questions? I mean, I think one, one thing is we were doing a little bit of snooping, um, I think, uh, a little bit of eavesdropping. Um, I think we've become used to that as a society now. We were doing it here. Um, is, is who sets the goals? OK, great. So I'll, I'll ask a quick question of saying, you know, for some people, I think there might have been a reaction. So wait a minute. You're letting these organizations set their own goals. You're not telling them what goals to have. Um, was, that a, was that a mind shift in, in city to, to take that approach or in some of the client work that you've done? Um, how do people think of that when they're used to being the goal setter? We're supporting them to make the impact on the community. Who am I to say what they should be doing in Fairfield County or Dallas and the, or the Youth Policy Institute in, in LA? We're trying to support those organizations and those people to get the things done they need to get done in the community. So again, our measure of success is that they decide what the measures of success and that they put in place a process to track them. That's interesting. It does resonate for me a little bit with what Jeremy at Purpose was saying, which is think like a movement builder and less like a philanthropist, right? That might be one way of exhibiting that and advice. And his organization is part of the effort. Uh, yeah, we, did you have a comment? I was just going to say, we use the term co-creation, which is very different than the typical strategy development process that a corporate philanthropy or, or foundation organization would go through, is that you actually have to sit around the table and develop it together. And that may go in directions that makes you feel uncomfortable if, uh, versus what it would go, where it would go if you actually had full control. But I think that we've seen that the uh, success of those efforts, if everyone is around the table developing the strategy, is so much greater. So that idea of co-creation from the outset is very important. OK, so there was a question back here. Interesting. So, kind of, are you thinking about HR marketing? How did I know? Okay. Um, any any thoughts from the panel about the types of internal collaboration it takes to take on something this big? Uh, internal collaboration is tremendously uh, important. It's 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 nice that inside um, our company there's a lot of effort on uh, there's a city collaborate site where um, employees are encouraged to um, collaborate. There's a lot of focus on internal communication. And um, I have to say, in a little mini way, um, increasingly the internal um, uh, office arrangements are all open space. And it's just fabulous. Um, it is. It, uh, it. Many years ago, I actually had to work on a, a bank platform 
Um, and people said, oh, how can you work out there when there are all these people around and calling customers and whatever? I thought it was great. Um, and so uh, I do think that, that the world is changing to collaborate uh, internally. Um, all the young people who are going to work don't want to go to work in cubicles and offices and blah, blah. They want to get out there, and success is, is collaboration. And I think what we've learned is it's collaboration from the very beginning, from the get-go. So I guess the old model was, OK, well, we design this little program over here. And then when it's all ready and done, then we go over to the communications people and say, oh, can you, uh, can you design a communications program for this? Um, so now you got to get everybody, the internal communicators, the external communicators, the program people, the marketing people, the, wh who all those people at the very beginning. And that's when you have a better chance of really getting collected buy-in internally. But it, it is tough in a big company. I think that's a very important point, and I see it not only what you're talking about, an internal collaboration, but also, you know, cross-company collaboration, where you can sometimes think that what you're doing is collaboration, but what you're really doing is kind of telling people that they should do your project with you. And I think there's a very big difference between, let's collaborate on this thing that I'm doing. And it's like, well, is that really collaboration, or is that just, you know, something else with the word collaboration pasted on top. So I think that's a good point, that, that it's about joint ownership and, and buy-in and co-creation, a word that you used earlier. Okay, what other questions bubbled up? Yeah, yeah. push on that a little bit. Just with the Mars example that you used, right? I think that um, sometimes it's an internal collaboration. It is for the business function and then a philanthropic or a charitable arm and the predominant impetus for the project is a business. There's a business reason. When we talk about internal collaboration, I think there's sometimes a lack of clarity when things arise. Because generally, most of our programs, the programs that we do in the community, are driven through a community relations function. And when a project arises driven by the business that has community benefit, I think it sometimes, it, for us internally, sends us into a little bit of a spin. Because we're really not quite sure how to collaborate in that way. And when it's not something that we have grown and nurtured and we're going out and trying to convene people and get them excited about it, it is all of a sudden, like, we need to do this for business. Community relations team, you need to now come along. There's a lack of clarity around well, who, who owns the role all of a sudden. They're kind of reversed. And who pays for it and who makes the ultimate decision? So in those examples, how does that work? Luckily, we have a global expert on shared value here. <laughs> so the, the advice that I often give is that it, it's, what's really helpful is to identify the intent or motivation by which you're doing any of these activities. So some of them are for sort of community engagement, local community involvement. Some of them are because your important stakeholders are involved and it, it's relationship building that you're doing. And some are more sort of uh, core business shared value type efforts. And being clear about the motivation and, and the strategic intent, if you will, of those efforts really helps to sort of take down some of those barriers about, well, should I be involved and why are we doing this? Is this PR or is this about the access to our precious commodity? Is it, you know, how, how are we doing this? Why are we doing this? I think sort of having clarity on sort of what you're doing, how it fits into the portfolio, helps to really bring people together around the, the same issue. You know, the other thing I'll say is, you know, there was a question that was um, earlier about sort of this sort of media sort of PR um, aspect of it. How do we sort of, you know, get credit for what we're doing? And I, I don't want to let the session go without hitting this one um, directly. With collective impact, companies need to sort of check their sort of PR orientation at the door. That's not to say that there's not a communications benefit. But if you come in with a mindset of, how am I gonna get a really good headline? How am I gonna get X number of media hits because of what I'm doing here? That's the wrong orientation. The orientation should be about the problem that we're seeking to solve, the, the, what's required to address that issue, who needs to be around the table, and you have to subordinate the communications objectives around that so that you can have trust in the room, so that folks around the table don't think you have an ulterior motive. And you know the, the Lilly example I talked about, the reconnecting to our waterways in, in Indianapolis, they had to spend time to get over this distrust of what's a private company doing with this? Or, you know, what's their ulterior motive? Are they trying to sort of benefit from this in a certain way? 
And once they sort of established that trust and, and got into it, it was actually much more effective. But there's this there's natural inclination to worry about what's the company trying to get out of that. And it's, you know, I will say it's not just companies. You know, foundations have the same challenge and nonprofits. Everyone wants to get credit for, for things for different reasons. And that needs to be subordinated in order to sort of have the collective impact effort be raised as sort of the, the highest priority. It's not that you can't have a PR agenda for any type of activity you do, but you're just recommending against it for this particular type of coalition building. Yeah, and you shouldn't lead with it, right? You shouldn't, that shouldn't be, I mean, again, it gets to motivation. If this is about something where you really want a communications play, you know, don't try to do a collective impact effort because I think it's really a different, it's a different outcome that you're going for. Well, I think that, you know, one thing that I've noticed in, in talking to companies over a number of years now is that sometimes we let ourselves get away with a very vague answer to the motivations question. You know, why are we doing this? Well, we want to improve the communities where we live and work, or well, because we think it'll be good for the business. But you have to kind of shave the motivation question a little bit more finely than that in a way that helps you navigate trade-offs. Right. Um, so if, if strategy is about trade-offs, uh, deciding what you will do and what you won't do, if you answer the motivation question too broadly, it's not going to be much of a guidepost for you when you try to have to navigate some trade-offs if what you're trying to do is just do good. So I think clarity around the motivations, which you were emphasizing, is important. And sometimes we think we've answered the motivation question, but we probably haven't given it a level of specificity that's going to actually help us make some real tough decisions when it's time to make those decisions. What other questions are out there? Yeah. Have you seen any examples where the quarterback is more an individual than an organization, especially in cases where you have multiple funders? So you need somebody who travels comfortably, not just in the community, but can communicate with multiple CEOs who are making funding decisions. So I'm not thinking of one sort of off the top of my head. That's not to say that they don't exist. But, you know, I mean, typically the, the quarterback or uh, backbone function is, is not. A, a massive staff. It's usually, you know, the the Strive partnership example in Cincinnati was, it was, you know, two and a half FTEs total, you know, the, to get started. So that's pretty small. In Indianapolis, they had a steering committee that had representatives from, uh, you know, one of the universities, from Lilly, from the mayor's office, and they met monthly. They but they only had about a, a half of a communications person that was full time. So you know, it, so it wasn't that much in terms of in terms of actual capacity. So um, you could imagine that function being served by one person, certainly in you know in collaboration with others. I'm going to take Heather's question next, and then I want to save a couple of our final moments together to get a little bit into the nitty gritty of what does this really take. And if you're not up for Pam's answer on what it really takes, hearing from Greg, what are some other options for how you might take the spirit of this forward? Okay, so Heather. Yeah, it's really a tactical question. And and tricks for that quarterback role and how to control that collaboration. Because at some point, you want to get everyone's input, you have a lot of partners there, but, but how do you keep it moving and get decisions made when you don't want to be that sort of totalitarian, you know, and no. Okay, great. You have to have a governance structure. I mean, that's got to be put in place right from the get-go. So almost all of these organizations, all of these efforts have a, uh, a collective, and then they have a steering committee and then they have separate committees to work on particular issues. But it's very important to have a structure that's credible to everybody because this is collective impact, not, gee, I'd like, again, the wording. It's not, will you help me, the, the quarterback, accomplish our objective, my objectives? No. It's, it's got to be the collectives. In, uh, so a governance structure and then this clear metrics implies shared goals. So you have to decide what you're trying to get done uh, and get agreement from everyone up front. And, that, and then start to create the, the data and the systems that will ena enable you to track success. And the genius of what I think was the, one of the originals, which was the Strive Network, was a tremendously complicated, I mean, it's a big collaborative, anchor institutions and businesses and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. But actually, the goals and the criteria were pretty simple. Uh, complicated to get done, but very much um, very clear in terms of everybody feeling they had a stake. Well, maybe I'll just leave it actually with Pam for a second, because you've started to give some indication here of um, 
creating governance structures, issuing RFPs, you know, all of this. You've given us a taste of what it's taken. Let's just hear the rest of the story in terms of how many people, how many years, how much money. I mean, what did it take to play the role that you've been playing? Well, we made a decision to start this um, as a one-year basis and then to learn from it and then decide how do we want to structure this going forward because we hadn't done something like this. So um, this is three and a half million dollars, I think, Kristen? 4.2 million. 4.2 million dollars for one year. Um, and it involves a lot of technical assistance, uh, a lot of engagement of multiple people on our side, as well as orchestrating, for example, the purpose uh, is, is one of the resources. So it's a tremendous uh, investment of, of time, money, attention, focus. Um, but remember, the origins of this go back like three years. We started with this, where is the future of community development going? We then produced the investing in what works in uh, America's communities. The, the book, which had three cabinet secretaries and luminaries who, who wrote those chapters. I didn't mention earlier that we then took the book, quote unquote, on the road, and different um, Federal Reserve banks around the country sponsored one day convenings so they could talk about what is collective, what, what, what is this model of the quarterback and future of community development, what is it in Boston, Dallas, LA, San Francisco, and again, that leads to the next part of it, which was about how do you put it into practice, and it and is in very local organizations, as you discovered when you asked for the hands to be raised. The two people who probably know Fraser are from Dallas, and the two people who know about Fairfield are probably from Connecticut. Right, great. Okay, um, I think you have some words of caution and some words of inspiration to close us out, Greg. You know, how, how, how would you provide a little bit of closing advice here for how people think about what might be appropriate for them? Yeah, so one, one note is that collective impact is not for everybody. You know, it's not for the faint of heart. It's super challenging and messy and nonlinear and dynamic. So there needs to be a readiness in your organization to take this on. If you've got limited budget or if you've got an environment in which you need to show sort of a lots of hard numbers and of results in a near-term basis and not a patience and understanding that social change, particularly around complex issues, particularly with multi-stakeholder efforts, requires time, requires some course correction, requires being very adaptive. If that's not a, a something that is, is ripe within your organization, then it's probably not the right timing. That said, as you think about what the opportunities are and corporations being a critical player in, in terms of addressing some of the most complex issues that are facing our communities, whether it's healthcare or education or economic development or environment, you all, everyone in this room needs to be at the table. And it's critical that we have these multi-sector approaches to solving these problems. So if you're not you know, sort of ready to be at one end of the spectrum in terms of being really a supporter and catalyst and funder of things, that's not to say that you can't be involved. So there's, there's a whole spectrum of ways you could, you could be a participant. So in the, um, in the Strive partnership in Cincinnati, you know, GE and Procter and Gamble were involved not as catalysts, not as big funders, but as participants. They you know supported and they you know provided some in-kind contributions. And you know, GE's Six Sigma black belts came in and helped with quality improvement, that type of thing. So there are ways to get involved that don't sort of you know don't um, involve being the full Monty, if you will, to to uh, to borrow Margaret's terminology. Um, so so I think that you know from from my perspective, this is a trend that is certainly picking up steam. It's something that you all should be considering in terms of how your organization uh, can in, engage in a productive way. And I guess the last thing I'll say is that there's a, there are a number of resources that we have, Margaret referenced them, on um, several websites. One is the collectiveimpactforum.org, which is a sort of a, a, 
essentially a community of practice around collective impact for practitioners that has various tools and case studies and videos of people doing things and and how to be a backbone and all these things, uh, the new report that Margaret referenced. So I'd encourage you to go there, sign up. It's free to sign up and, and join the community if you're interested because you can learn from others who have, um, have blazed this path ahead of you. And resources for all the sessions that you'll experience over the next two days will be aggregated on CECP's website to follow up from the summit. Um, <laughs> you know, the report that, that was so influential in Pam's thinking and then the publications by FSG will be on there. Well, I'm gonna take what you said and extend it just a little bit, which is, yes, you can do full collective impact and be the leader of that and, and have some great kind of long-term rewards for doing so. You can find another role if that is not suitable for you at this time, but I also think there's a bit of a philosophy behind what you're saying, and even if you don't take a role or the entire project, you can still take some of what was shared today and change your thinking a little bit, right? Who owns the goals? Who should set the goals? You know, when do I build collaboration in? I mean, these things could be influential in your practice. Forget collective impact, set that to the side, but there's certain ways that these organizations are thinking and the ways they're conducting the conversations and the ways they're building the relationships that might be different from what you're doing, which even if you don't go all the way to collective impact could still be pretty powerful. Well, with that, I would like to thank our panelists. And thank you all for the rich conversation that we had.